So, uh, sh uh, show of hands, first of all, uh, can you all hear me? Good, okay, second question. Uh, who here is a fan of trains and um, railways? Yep, and who here is a fan of computers? Yep, same number, roughly same number. And so, how many of you have thought about if there's a connection between these two things? Well, if you have done, uh, there's some hands here, great, 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 then you are in the right place. Uh, so this is my talk, uh, Riddles on Rails. My name is Dan Hagen, uh, and uh, it's going to be a fairly fa fast-paced talk. So we're going to start off talking a little bit about uh, safety, so safety for computers, safety for railways. And then uh, we're gonna, it's going to get a little bit weird for a little while, but stick with it, because at the end, it, we're going to go and look at some fun uh, puzzles and games. Um, so just a little bit about me. So I um, design a wireless control system. It's a battery-powered system for model railways. Uh, and I've been coming to Hacker Camps now since uh, 2011 or so. Um, and it was kind of a, a um, um, surprise to me when I sort of I looked at the history of um, sort of hacking and uh, hacker culture. That the original hackers, the people that actually called themselves uh, hackers originally, were actually model railway enthusiasts. So um, that you can sort of read about it in uh, Stephen Levy's book here. Uh, it's called uh, the Tech Model Railroad Club. Still exists at MIT, um, but they were really, really into, into uh, using computers to control their model railways, basically. Um, so let's talk first of all about uh, how we. How we do safety, but uh, not just safety for uh, uh, railways, but also for uh, computers. And actually, there's a very uh, strong relationship between the two. So uh, I want to take you back now to uh, uh, 1861. Um, and um, imagine it's sort of a, a bank holiday weekend. Um, people have been to go and visit the, uh, the pavilion. It's a very nice place in uh, uh, Brighton to visit. Um, and uh, so lots of people are going to get on their train, uh, trains and go home you know, to London or, or wherever. Um, and so just outside of um, Brighton, there is a, um, a tunnel. It's called the Clayton Tunnel. It's quite an ornate tunnel, uh, as most Victorian sort of buildings are. Um, and on this particular morning, there were uh, three trains that were uh, leave, uh, due to leave. And as it is with a, on one of these sort of busy mornings, they all were sort of very late to leave, and so they left at, uh, you know, within a very short succession. Um, and at the time, they were using sort of time intervals to. Just gonna, oh, yeah, sorry. The, and you can see, sorry, the timings that, um, of the um, uh, the departures. Now they're using time intervals to to leave uh, to to, um, to make sure you know, when a train's gone, um, you know, don't send the next one until you've got enough time between between it. Okay. Um, so let's have a look at the tunnel itself. So at the tunnel, you have, um, I mean, the tunnel itself, actually, you can't quite see all the way through the tunnel. So it has a slight kink at the end of it. So they have to have a signaler at each end of the tunnel, OK? Um, and so the, um, they basically ensure uh, entry and exit uh, of the tunnel. And now at the entrance of the south side, as you can see here, there was a, a ball, basically, it, and it rose up uh, to indicate that a train could proceed. Uh, and then it was uh, dropped to, um, uh, to indicate that, uh, uh, um, well, w once a train had gone past it, it was dropped automatically. OK, so let's just reset that and see what happened on this particular incident. So um, our first train goes past, OK, um, and then the signaler uh, on the south side um, signals to the north side and says, the train is in, now in the tunnel. Okay, nothing wrong with that. But then he notices something about the ball. So that ball hasn't dropped. Okay, so that's, that's our first sort of failure that's happened. Okay, mechanical failure. Okay, so what he does then, he rushes out with his flag. Okay, and he uh, um, he he's not quite quick enough because the next train's coming very very short uh, shortly after. So he's not quite quick enough. He's not quite sure if that second train has seen that flag. Okay. Um, but he's quick enough to actually stop the third train that comes along. Um, and then he can, uh, well, he has, a, he has a choice now. Does he send this, this third train into the tunnel or does he, does he wait? So what he does then, he, he sends a message to the uh, other signal and says, is the tunnel clear? Okay. Now, just at that moment, the first train that went into the tunnel exits the tunnel. Okay. Now, that north uh, side signaler, now tells the other signaler via a bell, you know, telegraph system. Um, he says, yeah, yeah, the tunnel's clear. However, I think you can probably guess what the, what's going to happen here. That second train is still in the tunnel. And that second train 
knows that flag was there, and he actually decides to reverse. Okay, that is also a failure that he should have uh, thought. Uh, you know, sh he should have thought about the consequences of that. So the what what happens is fairly obvious that the two trains collide, uh, 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 one reversing into the other, uh, and actually uh, uh, it's one of the, one of the most sort of. Uh, um, uh, kind of disastrous uh, uh, rail accidents, actually, sort of in rail history, in, in UK rail history. Uh, you know, 23 people actually died in that particular incident. Um, now, it's, the, the thing about it is, um, there are lots and lots of different ways you could actually correct this, and you can think about where the failure happened with this. Okay, um, so I'll leave that with you to kind of think about where you would correct the the, the the protocol that was going on there. Okay, so let's just have a look at um, more, a more modern way of doing signalling. So uh, if it's going to... Oh yeah, sorry, there's a little link here for if you're interested in more of this. There's lots and lots of data on this particular site that tells you about uh, other accidents and why they occurred and various things like that. Anyway, so uh, let's think about uh, in a station. Uh, so a signaler, uh, the signal box in the station can see the whole of the, the station and he can basically, um, he or she can basically uh, look, at that, uh, look at all the trains that are there and determine uh, whether or not they're going to collide and uh, and switch the points appropriately. But when you get to a tunnel, the situation is different. You, you basically, as we've seen, you can't actually see through the tunnel. And so you have to have a principle that you use to ensure that uh, the trains don't collide. Okay, so let's say we've got two stations A and B, um, and we, um, we use what's known as the absolute block system. So we make sure, we absolutely make sure that there is only ever one train in that uh, block section, okay? Um, Okay, so how do we do this? Well, station, uh, the signal at station B basically has control over the line uh, that's, uh, that precedes it, um, and the signal at station A has to request permission for trains to come into that section. Okay, and how do they do that? Well, as we've seen, there's, some, there's a telegraph system between them, so there's what we call a block instrument, as you can see here, uh, and uh, various sort of protocols for various bells that they use to say whether or not uh, to request to come into a section and whether something has cleared the section and so on. Okay, so um, then uh, how, what does the, uh, the, the train driver, the engine driver, see? So uh, at the entrance to the section, you've got a signal, and it's actually called a starter for fairly obvious reasons, and then you also have another signal at the exit to the uh, block called the home, so when you get home, basically. Um, and we can see actually what they look like. Now, notice something about the way that the, they are um, designed. So basically, the, the arm uh, is raised for the proceed uh, uh, aspect, but if it fails, for instance, then it will fail in the fail safe mode. Okay, so that's kind of so what's called upper quadrant. Um, and the signaler knows that the train has left the section because you can see here at the end of the train there is a red light. That's really important. If the train breaks halfway through, then that, if he doesn't see that red light, then he knows not to allow another train into that section. Okay, so we've gone and seen how the, uh, the railway operates and uh, um, ensures uh, safe operation from collision. How can we apply this to uh, software? So here are two processes. Uh, they're, they're basically running infinite loops, and they have two different uh, sections. So they have uh, a critical section, and they have a non-critical section, and then uh, protecting the entry and exit from that critical section are two primitives called signal and wait. Okay, so very very similar to the sort of block section that we've uh, seen with the with the railway. Okay, um, now this was this was actually designed by uh, a Dutch uh, computer scientist uh, called Ed Edgar Dijkstra, um, and he actually used the, um, the the names he originally used weren't uh, signal and wait, but um, P and V, and they uh, I'm told stand for equivalent um, uh, concepts from directly taken from the railway uh, analogy essentially. And so a semaphore in this case, uh, uh, you know, similar to the signal, uh, um, allows entry and exit to the critical section, but it is just a um, an integer. So Basically, at the point the integer becomes zero, uh, a, um, another process can, can take uh, um, or gain e entry to that critical section. And this basically, the critical section means that only one process is executing that, uh, which means if, you, if you've got a shared memory uh, a region, that only one process can read or write to it. So that ensures consistency. Uh, as you can imagine, if somebody's just read from a, 
uh, memory area, and they try to read from it immediately. Uh, something, something else tries to read, read from it uh, read, uh, immediately. Uh, what will happen is um, that they will have inconsistent views of that data. Okay, so that, that's semaphores. Now let's um, look at a another kind of safety issue. What, what we were discussing there was kind of um, safety. Uh, from a sort of uh, uh, a policy level, but this is more about say, uh, uh, sort of what what does the, the the kind of human operator do in the system? Okay, so the the trolley problem basically. So uh, imagine there's a, a, a trolley that's barreling down the tracks and it's uh, out of control. Okay, uh, and then there's some people on the tracks. Now it's not quite explained why they're on the tracks, but bear with it for now. Okay, um, and okay, so you, you then have control of a, a point, okay, um, so it's a fairly easy decision to make, you pull that point, except, of course, there is always a catch, there's somebody else on the other track. Now, there's only one person on the other track, so the, the kind of the decision process here is, well, what, what do you do? Do you, do you sort of say, well, if I wasn't here, and uh, that train was just coming down that track anyway, well, you know, those five people would, would be killed, right? So I, that, if I wasn't here, that would happen anyway. So if I just leave the, 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 the handle, um, it's the same thing, or is it, okay? And then the other thing is, well, if I pull that handle, I've, I've definitely, I mean, I've made that conscious decision. That one person is, it is gonna be killed, and that was my action that's done that, okay? So, so I mean, there's no, there's no, Right answer to this, but it's it's one of these problems which, as uh, in sort of immoral philosophy, uh, moral ethics and philosophy and the rest of it, uh, has uh, um, it, it has kind of created a lot of um, interest and, and debate basically. So I, I was kind of curious actually this idea of, of people, um, you know, people on tracks and it being a sort of uh, um, a sort of trope that you get. I mean, you think of silent movies, but actually it kind of goes back a lot further. It actually goes back to a, a play um, by. Uh, a guy called Augustine Daly, um, sort of a Victorian melodrama. Um, and the trolley problem itself is sort of a 60s problem, although you'll see it crop up in sort of internet memes. And there's lots of like quantum mechanics based ones anyway. Um, and um, yeah, and so uh, basically there's, there's you know, lots of sort of variations on, on, this, on this idea. Uh, where does it get application? Well, at autonomous vehicles. You think about uh, AI in autonomous vehicles, right? Um, so at some stage that vehicle has got to make a decision. Do I swerve uh, you know, to, to, to uh, uh, not hit a group of pedestrians, but what then happens to the passengers in my car? Okay, so, um, so this, this does kind of have applications. Of course, you could, have, you could of course put the vehicle on some rails and make it a bit safer that way, but anyway, we'll, we'll use AI, that's the, that's the way to do it. Okay, so, all right, so now it's gonna get a little bit weird. So we're gonna talk about time, so time, well, so look at this clock here. What, what can you notice about it? It has, it has two uh, minute hands, minute arms, okay? So this clock is uh, off uh, the uh, side of the Corn Exchange in Bristol, okay? And uh, these two uh, minute arms are there because one is for London time and one is for Bristol's time. Now this is at a time where all over the country everyone was setting their clock by the sun basically. So there was completely inconsistent uh, timing amongst all the different uh, locations. So it was complete chaos basically. And you have things like people would uh, make their uh, watch you know, run a bit faster when they were going from east to west versus or slower, uh, I forgot the right way around. But so one of those ways around, anyway. Um, so they correct for these these timings, and you know you can imagine all sorts of things like accidents and uh, and people just uh, missing trains. Um, so they had to figure out a way of getting around this. So what they came up with was a time distribution system known as the chronopher. So um, basically, this ran uh, along the telegraph wires. Um, and so you're using the pre-existing telegraph wires for signaling and so forth. And uh, it basically, um, uh, it, it basically became known as railway time as a result of this, actually. But it was used for more than just railway uh, uh, timings. Uh, okay, so this is a sort of schematic of the of the uh, timing. So, you, uh, sorry, of the chronopher system itself. So you can see on the top, uh, what is it on your side? On the top uh, left-hand side, you can see the incoming signal coming from Greenwich. Okay, this is the Greenwich uh, Mean Time, and then there are f uh, five, I believe, signals going out to various locations, and you can see the relays and the batteries at the bottom. Okay, so this this time signal was sent at 10 a.m. every day. So they had to clear. The, I mean, the, the, the telegraph wires were used for normal traffic, but they had 
had to clear that uh, line uh, at 10 a.m. every day to make sure that they got this time signature coming through. And I'm reliably informed even up to the 60s this was still being used. Um, and so, yeah, basically they'd, they'd listen out for this time signature and then they'd relay this time signature out to many, many other locations, okay? So distributing it out. Um, now, we actually have a very similar situation actually in computing. So we've got something known as the network time protocol, and you can see uh, the sort of the tree-like structure. So you can see it being distributed from a sort of essentially a, a sort of central source. So you have multiple what they call stratum zero clocks and various strata one, two, and three, and so on. So in the in the UK, for instance, we've got the National Physical Laboratory. Uh, in in the um, well, on ca on camp here, we actually have um, a couple of time servers as well. Um, so basically, um, you can see very similar uh, kind of uh, uh, principles being used here. Um, so um, yeah, how do we actually um, use this to synchronize our clocks? Well, basically, um, timestamp messages will be sent and received between two different servers, and uh, you'll use that to determine uh, various things like offset and drift and, and so forth. And then something known as uh, Missoula's algorithm, or slight variation on that, is used to uh, combine time signatures from mu multiple um, clocks, so basically to, to uh, get rid of uh, outliers, as it, as it were. Um, okay, so uh, that, was, that, that was sort of um, uh, the 19th century uh, view of time, um, which we kind of still use today, actually. But um, uh, um, back in the early 20th century, um, a chap called Einstein came along, and he thought a lot about time. Time was kind of important to him. So he has a, a various thought ex experiments, and one of them involves a train. Now, he, he envisaged somebody on a train, uh, with a stone or a pebble or whatever, and they throw that pebble and it hits the embankment, okay? Now, um, to the person on the train, the, uh, the, the pebble is basically, I mean, they don't throw it, but they, they, they let go of it. So uh, through gravity, the, the, the pebble is just going vertically down from their perspective, okay? So to the person on the embankment, though, they're seeing as a parabola, okay? So, uh, so he asked the question, basically, uh, what, which is the true, what the one true path this, this, uh, this pebble is or the stone is taking. Uh, and so he thinks this through and basically his conclusion is there isn't actually a one true path. So there is a path for each of these, what, what's known as these reference frames. So every reference frame uh, uh, basically has, so I'll move on, ah, move on to the next, uh, uh, there we go. So, if, uh, um, so basically every uh, reference frame, the, uh, the the laws of physics within each reference frame um, are the same. So there's no there's no sort of um, uh, special reference frame. So a lot of people look at this problem and they think, well, obviously the, the bank is is uh, you know bolted to the to the earth. It's 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 uh, um, you know the one true reference frame, and everything else is is relative to that. But his conclusion is no, that all these different reference frames are are uh, equally uh, um, their own. Uh, particular reference frame. And one particular part of this is that the speed of light in each reference frame um, is the same. Okay, so we'll need that in, the, in, in just a second. Okay, so how, how does he um, use this then um, to think about time? Well, uh, he imagines uh, lightning striking either end of the train. Okay, actually, I, he actually says hitting the rails, but it's the same thing, hitting the train effectively. Okay, so he's asking the question, are these events simultaneous? Okay, do these events occur at exactly the same time? Okay, um, and in particular, do they occur uh, for the, at the same time for the person stood on the bank, at the embankment, as for the person stood on the train? Okay, so um, basically, let's think about the person on the embankment. So that person, let's, let's imagine them midway between the two locations, okay? So we know that the speed of light is the same uh, in, in that reference frame as any other reference frame. So, he's, so she, she, um, uh, she's in, in, the, in the middle of uh, the, the, the two lightning strikes, and the light clearly is gonna take the same amount of time to reach her, basically, because it's got, it's got the same distance to travel. So for her, if she sees those as, uh, as simultaneous, if they do, if they really are simultaneous in her her reference frame, then um, th then she's basically going to you know th they're going to arrive at the same time because they've got to, they've had to traverse the same distance. And so basically, um, we can use this principle to, to 
for a given reference frame to say, well, all these clocks within that reference frame are all synchronized. Okay, we can look at the position of the hands and we can say all these, these hands are uh, pointing to the same position. Okay? Now let's think about the other um, uh, reference frame, the frame that's within the, uh, the train that's going along. Okay? So basically, if you consider the, <coughs> the midpoint along the train, so that, uh, that basically, uh, when, the, uh, when the, uh, the lightning strikes occur, that is, that is the same as the midpoint for the um, embankment frame. But crucially, it's moving uh, along. It's moving relative to the, the embankment. So actually, the, the light that's coming uh, along the train from behind and the light that's coming from uh, in front will take different amounts of time to reach that person. Because by the time that person has got further along the track, uh, uh, you know, the time that the light has reached them, they, they've got further along the track and there's less time it takes for that light to get to them um, from in front of them than it does behind them, okay? So there's a really, really profound um, conclusion for this, right? Which is that actually to say that events are simultaneous, a, a, you cannot say that unless you say they are simultaneous in this frame of reference, okay? That's a really, really crucial um, a conclusion from uh, uh, what's known as special relativity. Okay, so you might think, well, okay, this is, uh, this is very esoteric, you know, it doesn't really apply to uh, everyday kind of uh, uh, things, you know, speed of light and the rest of it. Well, actually, a GPS, um, uh, if you didn't correct for special and general relativity, uh, within a day, you basically, um, uh, the, 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 your position would drift so far that it would, it would be next to useless, okay? And uh, so that's an everyday kind of uh, usage of, um, uh, you know, of these principles. But even on a network, we've got um, uh, sort of uh, differential um, time through the network, you know, for delays in, in buffers and uh, um, different line speeds and so, and so forth. So within a distributed system, it, uh, different times, uh, um, uh, you know, different events occur at sort of different times and you can't really sort of have a consistent view of, of timing. And also, you could have someone that uh, purposefully says, well, uh, this thing occurred at that time or somebody along the way can, can, can maliciously change timestamps and so forth. So, um, it's a, when you start thinking about it, time in distributed systems on the network is actually a really, really slippery kind of um, concept to, to kind of deal with. Anyway, so people have looked at this, uh, and one of the uh, uh, concepts they've come up with is um, what's known as sort of logical clocks or Lamport uh, ti uh, timestamps or uh, um, uh, Lamport clocks. Um, so basically, um, for we've got three processes here, and we look at the middle one here. We've got uh, various events that occur within a process, okay, and it's fairly easy to work out that they'll occur in time order. Uh, so there's no problem there. Now, when we um, send a message between two different processes, well, I think we'll all agree that a message is sent before it's received. So then we've got some time ordering there. Okay, so what we got, what we have then is what's known as a, a partial order. So there are some events, for instance, these two here, which we can't actually say, well, that one occurred before that one or at the same time as that one and so forth. Okay, so it's, it's a slightly weaker kind of uh, notion of, of ordering of, of, uh, events in, in the system. And um, so variations on this theme uh, are what's in use at the moment for uh, timing within distributed systems. So, um, okay, so that, that, was, that was the the kind of weird stuff that's out of the way. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna skip one slide there, and I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna talk here about. Um, shunt, I will come back to that other slide, by the way. I, I'm um, gonna talk about shunting yards, okay? And um, the ba basically, you, there are, there's a kind of puzzle that's known as a shunting yard puzzle. There's lots and lots of these, and this this is one example. It's kind of the most famous example. So in this one, you have basically uh, you got a shunter, uh, and then you have eight. Uh, um, uh, uh, wagons, uh, coaches, um, they're given numbers, and you have to, uh, uh, well, ba basically you've got different uh, capacities on the two sidings, uh, three, sorry, the three sidings and on the spur, so the top two have uh, three, the bottom one has five, and the spur has four, but one of those is for the shunter. And so basically you've got to uh, shunt them, you know, just using the, the, the rails that you've got there basically, you've got to shunt the, um, uh, the wagons so you get the 
the wagons in the correct order, you know, one to five. Okay, so it's a, it's a fun kind of uh, puzzle, and there's lots of variations on this theme. Um, but you, you might uh, notice a kind of similarity here with a, a puzzle that's kind of very uh, often used in uh, um, uh, uh, um, you know, early programming kind of uh, 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 teaching and things like that. It's not quite the same puzzle, but it's a, it's a very similar puzzle. Um, uh, and as I say, there's all sorts of other variations on this theme. Um, so we've... We can also look, think about shunting yards in terms of um, uh, uh, um, basically uh, grammars. So you can, to generate a language, you need a grammar to say how you compose the various elements that are, you know, the little uh, the, 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 the parts that make up uh, words in that language. Okay, so normally you'd use something uh, uh, like a um, Backus Nar form, but this. Um, type of diagram is actually quite fairly, it used, to, it used to be more commonly used, but not so much these days. For instance, Pascal used to use it as a, a, a way of uh, defining their, their language. But it's, this is exactly uh, the, the context-free language is, is, that you get with uh, BNF uh, form. Um, so how do we use it? So give me, let me give you an example. Oh, by the way, this one comes from the JSON uh, specifications. So I'm sure a lot of you are kind of fairly familiar with this uh, uh, now and again. Um, so an exa one example of this, so these are uh, um, defining floating point numbers. So I've got one here which I can't quite remember. It's, well, anyway, that, that number there, <laughs> whichever one is, I think zero, minus 0 0.24, uh, has, um, has the following, you, know, you, you trace it through this path basically to get to, uh, get, you know, to, 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 uh, to define that number in that, in that grammar. So let me give you a, a, a slightly more complicated example that takes a different path through that. Okay, so that's how we, def how we define um, that. Um, uh, that, that particular number. So let's, uh, let's think about now, um, so I, I, I want to go in two different directions. So I've, I, can, I can define the, the sort of strings in my grammar, sorry, in my, in my language using the grammar, but maybe I want to take a, a string and then I want to decompose it and actually uh, evaluate it. Okay, so first of all, let's define a, a grammar that we can use to, to, to do that. Um, uh, that operation. So we're going to do something based on um, single-digit arithmetic um, expressions. And you'll notice this one does something that most shunting yards can't do, which is it's recursive. So you, you can take this entire um, uh, diagram and place it in each of the two expressions, either side of the um, uh, the operator in the middle. Okay. So let's, let's give you an example from this. Okay. So um, so this this. Um, uh, example. I notice I've put the numbers in in order. That will be important a little bit later on. So this example, we can't directly evaluate this. Well, the computer can't uh, directly evaluate it. At least it's not, it's not not easy for it to to do so. But there is a form um, known as um, reverse Polish notation. We might also know this as um, as postfix notation. The one at the top is actually infix notation. And this is actually a um, an easier form. To um, to evaluate because you can basically take the the numbers and the operators in the order that they come. So, for instance, we'll we'll have a stack and we'll push our first value on the stack, and then we'll uh, take uh, our next value, push that onto the stack, uh, and then we'll take our operator and then we'll combine the two top values on the stack um, to uh, 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 create the, the new value and then push that back onto the stack. Um, and so then we can do this and. Uh, Many times over, and then we've evaluated the whole expression, and in this case, it's two. Okay, so 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 we've got a problem here that we've got a, a, an expression in infix notation, and we want to need to get it into uh, postfix notation. Okay, so in order to do that, we use something. Ah, yeah. So we need we, we need so we need a way of doing that. Okay, and um, notice one thing. First of all, the numbers. Uh, when we convert between them are in the same order, okay? But sometimes the operators are in different order. So we're going to do some sort of, literally, we're going to do some shunting to get them into the right order. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, uh, again, um, this, is, this comes from, this, this comes from Dijkstra, uh, and basically uh, his, um, his mechanism of doing this basically uses a shunting yard. So let me quickly go through this. So we shunt our operators across two uh, the, uh, the siding, and then uh, by doing so, oops, by doing so, we can um, uh, get it into the right format. Okay, um, and then just a final thing about uh, uh, Dijkstra. 
he, he uh, uh, is very famous for this thing called the Dijkstra's algorithm. It turns out that um, uh, here, here in the UK, uh, people working on uh, um, the UK rail network uh, back in the 50s came up with the algorithm just you know, two or three years before, prior to him. Uh, and uh, that that's a very fa uh, sort of um, fascinating kind of story, and I urge you to kind of have, have a look more into that. But um, you know, um, certainly a lot of these things crop up now uh, again and again. Now I think I've I've run out of uh, time. There were a couple of videos here, but I shall um, I shall how I no I think <laughs> yeah are we. Very, uh, yeah, first, first one, yeah, that we'll do this one here. Okay, uh, and that, uh, hold on a bit. Thank you. So this is this is a, just a little a little puzzle here. So uh, you might notice that uh, that uh, the, uh, the 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 tracks in this particular orientation they look like they're different lengths, but I can show you that they're exactly the same length, right? So go and get some track and try and figure out why that's the case. Um, but I think I think that's the end. Okay, thank thank you very much.